check, check. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday morning. I'm so excited. It's the beginning of Holy Week, which for us is one of the most important weeks of, of the year. And so um, I'm thankful today we have all these beautiful young faces that are so excited to come and sing for you uh, just in a few moments in the service. And so grateful for Denise for leading that. I'm Reverend Jenny Williams. I'm the pastor here at Elm Springs. And uh, I want to welcome you to worship. If you're in the sanctuary, we're glad you're here. If you're worshiping with us online, uh, we're glad that you're joining us in that way too. Um, even if you're sitting here, I encourage you to pull out your phone and say hi to people who, on the Facebook feed who are worshiping with you because we can't get up and mill around and shake hands just yet, but that's another way that we can welcome one another to worship and say hi, and it lets us know that you're engaged as well. You can also submit prayer requests that way, and you can follow a link to give online at elmsprings.church if you want to give your offering that way. I just have a couple of announcements. First of all, immediately following this service is our Elm Springs Easter egg hunt. So uh, if you're watching online, you can get here by noon and we will get that started. We'll have littles up to first grade closer to the playground and we'll have our older kids second through fifth grade over on this side. So as you're making your way out there after this sort of divide and, and we'll conquer, I guess, right? Um, there's, I looked outside, there's approximately one million eggs, so everyone should leave happy. Um, and that'll be wonderful. We have uh, Holy Week worship services all during the week. I hope that you will um, come to as many as you can. We have a 6 p.m. Maundy Thursday service here in the sanctuary and a 6 p.m. Good Friday service here in the sanctuary as well. On Easter Sunday, we have four options to worship in person. We'll have our um, sunrise service out here on the basketball court. We'll have an 845 parking lot service in the main lot, and then we'll have a 945 modern contemporary service here in the sanctuary and an 11 classic service. Uh, we have asked that if you're planning on coming inside to register and let us know, we won't turn anybody away. We just want to make sure that we are able to accommodate any overflow that might be necessary. So thank you all so much. I am looking forward to uh, journeying through this Holy Week with each and every one of you. All right, will you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, today as we um, celebrate the coming King, as we sing Hosanna and wave our palm branches, remind us that this journey leads to the cross, that being a follower of Jesus is an act of self-sacrifice, but that in the end we know it is so, so worth it. Fill us up today, Lord, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to worship you so that we might leave this place ready to go and transform the world in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
Siren. Thank you to our kids. That was wonderful. If there are any other littles who want to go to Children's Church, you can follow this group out to, with Miss Denise to our Fellowship Hall area for your worship service. Would you all join me in a moment of prayer? You know, at Elm Springs, we believe that prayer matters. Um, and that's why we invite you to submit your prayer requests to us, not only so that we have a prayer team who will pray for you weekly, but also because we believe that pr prayer connects us to God and it also connects us to one another. So in this moment, as, as I'm praying, if you have a need that comes in your heart, feel free to silently offer that to God. God hears those prayers as well. Let's pray. God of the cross, tottering down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. You are not the savior we expect. Your power doesn't look like what we think it should. Your wisdom makes no sense to us at all sometimes. And we're happy to join the crowd waving branches on Sunday, but we're not sure we're ready to follow you th through this holy week into the temple courts into the upper room, into the garden of Gethsemane, to the high priest's house, to the assemblies of elders, to Pilate, to Herod, to Golgotha. We're not sure we're ready to follow you to the foot of the cross. Yet even as you laid down your life for us, you were thinking about us. You were caring about us. You forgave the sins of the centurions. You welcomed the thief to paradise. You made sure your mother was cared for in your absence. Lord, who cares about us, hear our needs now and send your healing presence to these we name before you. Sharon Lane, Jim Collins, Bob Collins, and family and friends of Doris Turn Time, who passed away this week. Lord, we need you to go on this Holy Week journey with us. Grant us your clear vision. Give us courageous hearts. And help us have persistent feet who are willing to follow you to the darkest place, step by step. We know you will lead us back into your light. And even though we know what this week will bring, we sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, O Lord. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ, who taught us how to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down Mount Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. I, I love a good parade. Anybody with me? I've been to parades my whole life, um, and I just love them. I have two vivid memories of parades. They both happen to be Fourth of July parades. One was when I was from when I was a little girl, and I remember I was with my family, my extended family cousins, and we all put on our matching homemade puff paint you know, 4th of July shirts, and then we ran outside, and we got, got by the curb. We picked the best spot so that we'd be closest to the action, and of course, gather all of the candy that was thrown at us, and um, at this parade, I remember there were fire trucks, and shriners, and bands, and um, there was so much going on, and stars and stripes splashed from beginning to end, and it lasted a half an hour or so, and It was just pure bliss. The other parade that I always think about uh, is a little bit of a more recent experience. Um, When my daughter was two, we lived, uh, we rented a condo in a retirement community in southwest Little Rock. And this community boasted uh, a, a pet parade every 4th of July. I mean, this they advertised it for weeks. If you don't know what a pet parade is, imagine uh, 15 to 20 adorable dogs and a few really, really confident cats uh, dressed in some sort of star-spangled uh, paraphernalia and then marching around the circle that was our neighborhood. It was such an exciting moment. Of course, we anticipated this with our toddler for weeks. And, and what we found out after the first time was that it only lasts about three and a half or four minutes, depending on where you are in the neighborhood. And so the first year we got out there and prepared to watch, we had a diaper incident. And by the time we got back outside, we were just in time to see the last few paws bound around the corner. Well, the next year we were prepared, and so we got on our porch, and we got all the supplies ready, you know, snacks and drinks, and we were ready to cheer on our pet parade, and it lasted like three and a half minutes, and shrieking and laughing and pointing, and Clark enjoyed it too. (laughs) My point is, parades serve all sorts of functions. Uh, Sometimes they're for celebration, uh, like the ones I was talking about. And sometimes they serve a political function as well. Occasionally, they do both. Um, with the exception maybe of this year, uh, historically, our, our um, inauguration usually commen- ends, ends in a parade. The, um, the new president and vice president will take their spouse, go get in a limousine, and then parade around the city to celebrate with their constituents. And this tradition has dated all the way back to George Washington. I thought about another kind of parade as well. It's more of a march. I thought about the civil rights marches from the 60s. You know, these parades of sorts empowered people who who wanted to come alongside uh, the movement for equality but didn't really know where to start. But these marches also created tension and even fear for people who weren't ready to leave the status quo and argue for equality. Indeed, parades have served a political function and have been a huge part of our social landscape 
for many, many years. The thing is, I think you'll find that not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. See, in fact, some scholars, when they're talking about this parade, this procession into Jerusalem, they mention that it's very possible, even likely, that there was another parade coming into Jerusalem for Passover that same week. Maybe even happened on the same day. So while Jesus is entering the city from the Mount of Olives, it's entirely possible that another parade was entering the city from the coast. This one would have been for Pontius Pilate. He was the Roman governor charged with keeping the peace during the week-long Passover festivities. And Passover, remember, was the Jewish holiday of remembrance and celebration of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Think back to Moses and Pharaoh The final of the ten plagues was going to be the angel of death. And so the firstborn of every household would die, but God told the people of Israel to paint lamb's blood over their door so that when the angel of death came through, it would pass over those homes with blood painted on. Each year, thousands of Jewish pilgrims would enter into the city to celebrate and feast together. Uh, To Jesus' contemporaries, though, this celebration was kind of ironic. You know, these faithful Jews would come and they would um, celebrate their deliverance while at the same time still being held under the thumb of the Roman Empire. Riots were common during this week because of this. And so Pilate's parade into the city was a reminder of the ever-present empire. The show of strength and brute force was supposed to squelch uprisings before they started. And it was a procession of pomp and circumstances. The bigger, the better. He, Pilate would have entered the city riding on a large steed, and he would have been flanked by soldiers and chariots, and they would have had huge swords and weapons. And the point of all of this was to say, don't mess with Rome. But what about the other parade? What about that grassroots procession entering the city on the other side? The one we read about in scripture. Jesus riding in on a donkey to the worship and the adoration of people who've come come to follow him, throwing their cloaks on the ground, singing praise and worship. It seems exciting. It seems important. There's even a note of hope in it. In contrast to the the politically charged Roman demonstration, this little parade seems humble and organic, maybe even a little folksy. But even though it feels a little bit out of place in Holy Week, it absolutely was not. You've heard me say this many times, but Lent is an incredibly important season in the life of a Christian. Lent is one of those moments where we can take a step back and we recognize our own humanity. And we make sacrifices in our daily routine, and we intentionally reflect on our faith and what God has done for us. Most importantly, during Lent, we recognize that God is God, and we are not. And thank God for that. I confess that I've spent a lot of my life feeling the relief of Palm Sunday. How could you not? The precious children, they come forward, they wave their branches, they sing. We get to sigh sigh a breath of relief in the midst of all this time of repentance and penitence. I've almost seen this as the calm before the storm that's coming later on in the week. But here's the deal. Once we take a closer look at this story, we realize it's not random. It's not random at all. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that's what most of our Bibles label this part of Scripture, is in every one of the four Gospels. And in fact, in each one, it's remarkably similar. The accounts are that Jesus and the disciples stop at the Mount of Olives, and they prepare to make their way into Jerusalem. In Luke's Gospel, this completes a journey that starts back in chapter 9. In Luke 9, verse 51, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Ten chapters later, he finds himself on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the same city. 
Jesus instructs his disciples to go to a nearby village, and he says, go and get a colt that's never been ridden and bring it back. And if anybody asks you why you need it, tell them the Lord needs it. Well, the disciples do what he says, and things happen the way Jesus predicted. They go, they find a colt sitting there tied up. They start untying it. The owners say, why are you untying our colt? And they say, the Lord needs it. Okay, they bring it back. Jesus saddles up and begins his journey into Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting that a journey that has taken 10 chapters of Scripture, that has been primarily on foot, pauses now, so that Jesus can grab a ride. In reality, the distance from the Mount of Olives to the temple gates was probably less than a mile. Surely he could have completed this on foot. But what we see is that this decision to stop and to ride in rather than walk is very intentional. It's not because Jesus is too tired to continue. It's because he's about to make a very real statement about who and about what he is. The timing, the timing could not be more appropriate. The political climate in Jerusalem is completely ramped up because of Passover. Then Roman rule is at an all-time high. State-sanctioned violence threatens nearly every single Jewish person, regardless of their class or their status. The state had even appointed a a Jewish monarch. Uh, The Herods that we read about at Jesus' birth and all the way until now, these were appointed in order to appease the Jews. But this only increases the people's desire to be out from under the empire because they don't want a puppet king. They don't want someone who's beholden to the state. They want the Messiah, the one that God had promised them through the prophets. Jesus' ministry at this point has created quite a buzz, as would happen when someone is healing the sick and opening blind eyes and even raising the dead. What had started as quiet rumblings, quiet questions from the crowds and even from Jesus' disciples had grown into a dull roar with questions like, who is he? Is he the one? Is he from God? Or is he from the devil? And this time, the time had come for Christ to finally reveal himself, his whole self, to the people. It's time for him to enter the city as the self-proclaimed and divinely appointed Messiah. On that particular day, when Jesus mounted that colt, it wasn't as a wandering prophet or a random somebody. It was as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the Prince of peace. He knew it, his disciples knew it, and the crowds knew it. The people line the streets to see this historic moment. They throw their cloaks down on the road and to show their submission to this new king. And they shout and sing praises. They chant the words from the Psalms, Psalm 118. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. I mentioned earlier that of the four gospel accounts, they're all really similar. But you might have noticed that the gospel of Luke leaves out some of our most common elements of Palm Sunday. Did you notice there were no hosannas raised? There were no palm leaves or branches of any kind waved. Even the words of the crowd uh, don't say, Hosanna, save us. They actually change the words to focus on Jesus as king. The king who would usher in peace, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And this is because for Luke, the, the most important thing, the thing that Christ's ministry and mission is founded on, is peace. This is why in Luke, the the angels announce the birth of Christ by saying, glory in the highest, peace on earth. It's why uh, in the very next chapter, uh, or in the very next section of scripture, Jesus looks over Jerusalem and he weeps and he says, if only you knew what would bring you peace. Peace was Jesus' first and foremost purpose. But And here's what Luke wants us to know. 
the peace of Jesus is not the sort of peace that just draws everyone around a campfire singing kumbaya. The peace of Christ is a peace that topples the powerful. The peace of Christ frees the oppressed. And it, it heals on the Sabbath, and it dines with sinners and outcasts. The peace of Christ says that true peace can only be understood and realized through self-sacrifice. Jesus didn't announce himself as Messiah with all the pomp and circumstance of the Roman parade. He didn't usher in the kingdom of God on a Clydesdale, holding the longest, shiniest sword flanked in warriors, ready to wage a military battle against his enemies. No. Instead, Jesus paves the way for the kingdom, riding on a humble donkey to a crowd of average people, knowing full well, full well that shortly after that, he'd dismount his colt, and he'd take up his cross, and he'd lay down his life. If the point of Pilate's parade was to make a political statement about who was in charge, then Jesus' parade was basically insurrection. It was treason. And it's not just treason on the part of Jesus, uh, but also for every single person who stood by that roadside and worshipped him as king. So what this means is that the significance of this parade cannot be understated. It wasn't a sigh of relief before the coming doom. It was the proverbial shot heard round the world that begun the divine battle. Palm Sunday isn't the last hurrah before the cross. It's the beginning of the journey. And Jesus knows this. He knows all of this. He knows there's no turning back after he mounts that horse and rides in the parade. And it explains why we really don't hear a lot from Jesus. He's pretty quiet during all this. He's very solemn, you know, and he, he doesn't bask in the crowd's adoration because he knows they expect a Messiah that's going to match Rome's violence and power, and they expect Jesus to save them by defeating Rome not realizing that the salvation that the Messiah that Jesus is bringing isn't freedom from Rome, but freedom from sin. Jesus also knows that the same people shouting praise him, shouting Hosanna, or shouting peace in heaven are the same people who will likely be shouting crucify him at the end of the week. There's one more detail that Luke's gospel offers that the others don't. In Luke's account, the Pharisees are standing by, they're watching, and when they hear the, these chants of worship, they, they stop Jesus and they said, you have got to end this. This has to stop. Because not only is this treasonous to the empire, what's happening, but for the religious leaders, this is blasphemy. There's only one God in Israel And to worship anyone or anything else is blasphemy. It's breaking the covenant. But Jesus says, if they keep silent, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out. This moment, he's saying, this moment was inevitable. It was divinely appointed. God's kingdom of peace is coming, and it's coming through a Messiah called Jesus. And since the beginning, even if the people weren't going to shout it out, then the creation would, the rocks would. They would bear witness to this coming kingdom. When God created the world, God's creation, God's handiwork, was designed to proclaim God's glory. And that includes us. But in in case we ever find ourselves unwilling or unable to do that, God will use someone or something else to proclaim the peace of Christ. We chose the rocks cry out as the theme for for Lent here at Elm Springs because the scripture reminds us that we cannot leave it up to someone else to declare the peace of Jesus. Peace that is different. The peace that probably feels absurd to anybody on the outside 
but we know that we can trust in Christ's peace, that Christ's peace breaks down walls, that Christ's peace heals relationships, heals minds, bodies, and souls, and it changes hearts. And so Jesus' peace may seem weird to the world, but we know. We know it's worth it. When you came in the sanctuary, you should have received a a glass rock, a stone. And I want to invite you to take this stone with you this week as a reminder that we can't let someone else do what we were created to do. And you don't have to keep track of it forever, but I invite you for the next week as we journey through Holy Week to put it somewhere where you can see it and to prayerfully imagine, to think seriously about the ways that you can help bring the peace of Christ into your own lives and into the lives of those around you. Maybe it'll be making peace with a coworker, or maybe it's finally forgiving a friend or a family member, or maybe it's just seeing something you disagree with on Facebook and continuing on scrolling. Whatever it is, find a way to live out Christ's peace this week. We know, we know well the events of Holy Week. On Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. On Monday, he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday, he confronts the Pharisees and the religious leaders. On Wednesday, he talks about the final judgment On Thursday, he dines with his friends for the last time, and and he is betrayed by one of them later on in the garden. And on Friday, he gives up his life for us. He's crucified. Then on Saturday, all we have left to do is wait. And so we wait. But we don't wait without hope. We don't wait without hope. We wait in the hope and in the promise of a risen Lord. We wait in the darkness for the coming light. And we do this because we know Sunday is coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and join me this morning in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is the moment in our service where we get to worship through our offering. Um, and I want to remind you, too, our, um, our Lent offering, our Lent special offering has been in support of our youth ministry, our envelope fundraiser out in the hallway. If you haven't had a chance to grab an envelope and give the amount written on the front of the, of the envelope, I encourage you to do that. For three days this week, our youth came onto campus, and they served by cleaning up, by putting the eggs together, and were a part of the vital ministries that we do every week here. And so when you support them, you support them learning how to serve and be uh, participate in the life of the church as well. Um, as our band prepare, as our musicians prepare to play, I want to remind you that you can give online at elmsprings.church, or you can come forward and give in the boxes that are somewhere or there's one in the back, (laughs) one right there, I'm sorry. Um, And we are just so thankful for your willingness to continue to support what God is doing through Elm Springs. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, as we offer ourselves, we do so because we are made to be like you. 
and you are a generous God, and so we are called and made to be generous people. Bless these tithes and offerings as we give them to you, knowing and trusting that your spirit will lead us and guide us as we help make a difference in our community and in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. The blood of Christ is our hope and our peace. So go from here, remembering that you can offer the peace of Christ anywhere and everywhere you go, because Christ has already shown us the way. I hope you'll join us for one of our worship services this week, and I hope that you experience Christ this week in a new way. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>